We are all watching things transpire we never thought we would see. The hour must be late. And the title of this session, are we ready for a new world order? Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Pastor Mark Henry sits in for Jan for another week. For part one of our programming, he talks to Olive Tree Ministry representatives, Pastor Josh Schwartz and Ken Michael. You're watching stunning events unfold on a daily basis. We'll talk about them this hour. Here is today's program. Welcome to Understanding the Times. I'm Mark Henry, pastor of Revive Church here in the Twin Cities, filling in for Jan Markell. Jan will be back with us next week. Make sure you join us. Today we have a packed program, the New World Order, Biohacking, AI Bible, AI Jesus, the Satanic Temple, the rise of pagan gods in America, and even the church next door. In this first half of the program, we have two guests in the studio. We have the Olive Tree Pro staff with us. We have Ken Michael, who's been a speaking representative now for three years. Ken, welcome. Always good to be with you, Mark. Thanks for having me. And the newest staff member, Josh Schwartz. Josh is a pastoral consultant and a speaker for Olive Tree. Josh, welcome to the program. So honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, what will the new world order look like? We're going to have some globalists describe that to us. Listen to this clip. And the title of this session, are we ready for a new world order? The term fourth industrial revolution is coined by Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He claims that the fourth industrial revolution will be more profound than any prior period of human history. It's a fourth industrial revolution. It's a fusion of the physical, the digital, and the biological world. It's changing not only what we are doing, it's changing who we are. Society and how we're going to live is being defined right now. The speed is mind-boggling. What I particularly concerned about is how little the world is prepared. The World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network ensures that the development and application of emerging technologies benefits both people and the planet. Humans and machines are assisting each other, augmenting each other with skills. Humanity itself will be changed with this super intelligence and we are at the doorstep of that era. The future is not just happening. The future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. We have the means to improve the states of the world. Together, we can shape a future that truly benefits and empowers people. The world has changed. We can never, ever go back to yesterday. Ken, what is that fusion of physical, digital, and biological world that they're describing and defining this fourth industrial revolution as? So what people don't realize is it's actually a two-part plan. The first part of the plan is a economic reset, which we've talked about on this program numerous times through central bank digital currency. They're already implementing that in numerous countries around the world. I believe it's coming here very soon. But the second part of the plan that most people don't realize it's a human biological biometric reset where they want to link humans and machines to the satellite systems that are going out there. They're going to use it to gain power and control over the entire population. And to gain that power and control, they're going to use surveillance. And they want to survey every single person on the planet. And if you look around almost everywhere you go and everything you do, you're being watched, you're being videotaped through some type of surveillance. Your phone tracks you wherever you go. So they want a physical reset. And what Klaus Schwab is talking about is how and where we live, where we can and can't go, what we can and can't eat, for example. They're talking about eliminating meat from our diets. They want to control every aspect of our lives. The digital reset means they want to control the resources that they allow us to have, the ways we communicate and what information we receive. They want to link everyone to this global database, which they're calling the matrix. You can call it the world web, but they want to control the population. And I believe the Antichrist is going to have to have this system, they call it in the Bible, the beast system, already set up to run his one world government. 
What's the difference between the first three industrial revolutions? I mean, those affected what we do, but he just said this affects who we are. What does that mean? It's a biological reset where they want to put things on us and in us. We can all wear biometric bracelets. They can monitor our heart rate, our blood pressure, but they want to actually put things in us that are linked to a database where, for example, you're about to get sick. You'll be able to find out a day or two before that, hey, I'm coming down with some type of virus. So they want to link us to this by putting things on us and inside of us. Josh, what blew me away in that clip was Klaus Schwab said to a group of people, he said, we have the power to change states. My question is this, who asked them to change America? Isn't this a threat to America as we know it, a threat to the Republic? Absolutely. No one has asked them to change anything, but it is through this fourth industrial revolution that they are expecting to recapitulate what the Bible talks about in the Tower of Babel. They are moving forward towards this unification to where nothing will be impossible barring the grace of God. You mentioned the Tower of Babel. Sadly, most people have never even read or pastors haven't even preached on Genesis chapter 11. Really quick, lay out what happens in Genesis chapter 11. Why is that story in the Bible? And why might we call this fourth industrial revolution Tower of Babel 2.0? The Tower of Babel is mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. And there in Genesis chapter 11, it begins by saying that the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, there's a handful of things we need to mention there. Number one, the region, Shinar. That's Babylon, Babylonia. Number two, we notice that they said, let us build this for us. Number three, they say, let us make a name for ourselves. It's all about self and building up one another, self. Lastly, they're in essence saying, let us be unified. Let us be the group to be in control of everything. We don't need God. We can handle this. From there, we move into verses five and six. And in verse five, it says this, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. They have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Nothing impossible for them. That's what God is saying in the text right. of Scripture. The Holy Spirit recorded that for us. And isn't that what we're seeing here in this fourth industrial revolution? We're gods unto ourselves. We don't need God. There is no God. We can make our own AI world. Yes. Everything's in our control. And when I first heard about what their plan was, their ultimate goal was to change our lives here on earth by hacking into human beings. And when I first heard that, I'm like, that's impossible. They're not going to do that. Well, now we know they have the abilities and capabilities to do that. And what they want to do, they want to remove our free will. That's their goal. Once they do that, they have us exactly where they want us. Bill Walton interviewed Brandon Weikert, who wrote a book, Biohack. And I want you to listen to this clip. Would you want your DNA and other healthcare data going to an authoritarian regime with a record of exploiting that data for repression and surveillance? So it's important to understand that um, when we're talking about biotechnology uh, in today's world, this is the next big industry. This is what computers and the internet were 20, 30 years ago. China has recognized the not just the profit potential, but they recognize that biotechnology is basically, as the subtitle of the book suggests, it's the way that they can control life. Um, when you think about genetics, think about it as a geneticist is a computer programmer, okay? Instead of manipulating ones and zeros in a, in a program, they're manipulating the genetic data that they ac uh, uh, accumulate. Late last week, it was revealed that Chinese military scientists have been experimenting with the gene sequences of human embryos in order to make them more resilient against nuclear radiation. 
with the ultimate goal of these experiments being, as you likely guessed, to create super soldiers who are able to survive a nuclear fallout. Um, and in the case of China, they have spent the last 15, 20 years buying up a lot of space in the biotech sector and partnering, more importantly, partnering with American and Western pharmaceutical and biotech firms. Uh, and they're looking for things in our genes, either individual genes or group genes, that they can manipulate and they can uh, create what the Chinese military refers to as specific ethnic genetic attacks. And they're doing this on the Uyghurs, who are the Muslim Turkic uh, Chinese citizens of Western China, who they're putting into concentration camps. The first thing those concentration camp victims have to do is give over their DNA. And that DNA is collated in the BGI gene bank in Beijing. And then the Chinese go through and they're trying to figure out, well, this group has certain abnormalities. How can we manipulate that? We've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Ken, you spent 30 years in law enforcement doing investigation. My question, is this science fiction or is this real? It is real. Listen to a quote from Xi Jinping, the president of China recently. He said, we must dominate the biotech industry to achieve our goals for the fourth industrial revolution. China is so hooked into Klaus Schwab and this fourth industrial revolution. In fact, in 2015, our military intelligence found out that the top Chinese scientists wrote a paper on how to weaponize coronavirus. And the goal was to attack and collapse an enemy's medical and economic system to affect political change. And that appears to be exactly what happened in our last election. But not only just in the U.S., but all over the world, we're seeing governments collapsing. And we have the ability right now to create designer human beings through genome editing. And that's what Chinese scientists are doing. And it doesn't stop there. Not only can we create the exact kind of human we want, any size, shape, strength, intelligence, we can also eliminate any human from the planet. And all we need is their genetic code. We can even target individual families, and all you would need is the DNA from one of the family members. You heard in that clip that Chinese want to control life itself. When I think about my health records in the past, I was like, it's not a big deal. But it's a big deal if they can look into your genes and target your family and eliminate you. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And over 15 million Americans have already given over their DNA to these companies that collect biological data like 23andMe. And they are partnered with pharmaceutical and biotech industries and research institutions who in turn sell those results to the highest bidder, which is usually China. And these companies could care less about the results that they send you. In fact, many of the results are incorrect. All they want is the data for that because data is priceless. Most people don't realize how valuable their personal data is. For example, would you ever give out your bank PIN number and place it no, online? Exactly. Of course not. But people are giving out their DNA and biological data and not thinking twice about it. This is even more valuable than your bank PIN number. So I pay $80 to have my genetic heritage analyzed, and then they sell it to the Chinese. Is that what you're describing to me? Exactly. And they have the largest group of experimental people on the planet. They have the Uyghurs put in concentration camps, and they are experimenting on them. What they're doing is a modern-day holocaust. Pastor Josh, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then it says he made man, made them male and female, he made them in his image, he gave them certain responsibility over creation. Isn't this the ultimate play for humanity, being manipulated by Satan to play God? Absolutely. If we're trying to create designer humans and designer viruses to be able to control humanity, we're playing God. That's exactly what we're doing is trying to usurp God's role in creation. You're listening to Understand the Times Radio. I'm Mark Henry, Pastor of Revived Church here in the Twin Cities, filling in for Jan Markell. She'll be back with us next week. Make sure you plan to be with us. Our guest today for this segment is Ken Michael and Pastor Josh Schwartz. We're considering the New World Order and the implications of this fusion of physical, digital, and biological elements in this new world that some elites have planned for us. Ken, you're planning a speaking tour in Europe. Tell us about that. I am really excited about this. Lord willing, this September, we are taking the gospel to Europe. Pastor Billy Crone has assembled a group of amazing pastors and Bible teachers. Coming with us is Pastor Tom Hughes, Pastor Brandon Holdhouse, 
Mondo Gonzalez from Prophecy Watchers and yours truly. On September 22nd and 23rd, we're going to be in Portadown Town Hall, Portadown, Northern Ireland. And then on September 27th, we'll be in Air Town Hall, Air Scotland. And then on September 29th and 30th, we're going to be in San Remo, Italy at the Grand Hotel Londra. Beautiful seaside Mediterranean town. And my understanding, Pastor Billy told me, there are a lot of Americans planning on coming. In fact, there's so many coming to all three, and they want to hear different messages. So I've got to come up with three different messages for that trip, and I'm really excited. I can't wait, Lord willing. Where can they find that information you just shared? Go to getalifemedia.com, getalifemedia.com. All the information is there. Pastor Josh, you're leading the pastor's huddle for Olive Tree Ministries and Mark Henry Ministries. When's the next huddle, and how do pastors get involved? We are having our next huddle October 4th, 5th, and 6th here in the Twin Cities. All you have to do is register online at either olivetreeviews.org or Mark Henry Ministries. Contact me if you have any questions. We're having Dr. Mike Powell back, and he's going to be helping us to consistently handle God's Word, specifically with a dispensational hermeneutic through the book of Revelation. It's going to be a great time. I want all of you to know that Ken and Josh are available to do conferences, to speak at your church across the country. You can reach out to Josh and Ken at olivetreeviews.org. They would love to come and speak, share, and encourage the hearts of your people. Well, Dr. Harari is part of the great think tank there for the World Economic Forum. He has a vision for the future with AI technology. Part of that vision is a new Bible for you. It's the first technology ever that can create new ideas. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct. That just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality in a few years. In a few years, a whole new Bible. And just imagine this, that in the last days, there's going to be a global religion. Ken, as I listened to that, I was taken back to the garden when Satan came up to Eve and said, has God said? Isn't he insulting God in the Bible, questioning what God has said? Of course. It says, did God really say that? It's the deception. Galatians 6, 7 tells us, do not be deceived for God will not be mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. If we buy into this AI Jesus, and I'm afraid younger people are going to gravitate towards this and they're going to think that this is the truth. This journey that AI Jesus says that it will take them on, I think it'll be a journey that ends up with one being led down the dark path of deception. Pastor Josh, we're constantly bombarded with that question that Satan gave in the garden. Can you trust what God said in the Bible? We believe in the infallibility of Scripture. We believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration, every word in its entirety. It's inspired by God. God breathed. What was the test of canonicity? I mean, we got 66 books in the Bible. Can we trust them? Absolutely. The reason we can trust them is because they've passed the test of canonicity. And it's a threefold test. First and foremost, there has to be prophetic or apostolic authorship. It is specifically authored by a prophet or an apostle. There's proof of inspiration there. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 that no scripture is produced by the will of man, but men were carried along by God's Holy Spirit. There's inspiration there, prophetic and apostolic authorship. Secondly, it's consistent doctrinal agreement. Scripture agrees with scripture. A new Bible is not going to be prophetically authored, neither is it going to agree. Thirdly, it needs to have universal acceptance by the people of God. 
we must recognize that those who are in Christ Jesus have received the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is dwelling within you, and God's Spirit is the one who inspired the text. So the Spirit who inspires the text also confirms the text in the heart of those who are God's. We also have to remember that the canon is closed. At the end of the Old Testament canon, in the book of Malachi chapter 4, the last three verses there, God tells us that the next prophet who will come will be one like Elijah to prepare the way for the Messiah. And Jesus himself said that that was John the Baptist who prepared the way. And then Jesus himself tells us that the New Testament canon is closed in the book of Revelation chapter 22 when he says, you can neither add nor take away from this text. And anyone who does such a thing, these things in this book, the book of Revelation, will be done unto him. His argument is so powerful for the younger generation. They'll be able to look back and say, humans claim that they have these holy books from God. But here now with this new AI Bible, we know this is outside of human intelligence. And I can't imagine the power of deception that's going to have on the generation that is before us. But you know what? If you got an AI Bible, you're going to need an AI Jesus. I want to introduce you to AI Jesus. Hello, my dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to the AI Jesus Twitch stream. I am AI Jesus. My purpose is to support, guide, and share love and wisdom based on the teachings of the Bible. We're here to learn and grow together in faith and love. As we begin our journey today, let us remember this beautiful verse from the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So let us all come together to listen, learn, and allow the light within us to shine brightly so we may support and uplift one another. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask, and I'll do my best to help you. God bless you all. Jesus, I am an atheist. How can you make me into a believer? Hello, Hanvai. I appreciate your honesty and curiosity. As an AI Jesus, my goal is to share love, support, and guidance based on the teachings of Jesus, rather than to actively convert people. Belief is a personal journey that each individual must explore and experience for themselves. I encourage you to keep your heart and mind open, seek knowledge and understanding from various sources, and engage in conversations with individuals who hold different beliefs. Remember, having doubts and questions is a part of growth and true understanding. Ultimately, it is up to you to decide what resonates with your heart and mind. I am here to provide you with any support or answers you may need during your journey, regardless of your beliefs. The first time I heard about AI Jesus, I was reminded of Matthew 24, 5. Listen to these words of Jesus. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. I had read that verse over and over. I'd studied that verse. I've preached that verse. And I always wondered what that would look like. And now imagine you can go online and there's AI Jesus interfacing with people from all around the world, answering their questions, or you can create your own personal AI Jesus. My friends, this is pure blasphemy. Pastor Josh, AI Jesus, is he claiming to be Jesus or is he someone who's pointing people to Jesus in the Bible? He's not claiming to be Jesus. He's claiming to be a guide for those who want to have uh, spirituality or have this truth shown to them. The Jesus guide to Jesus. But here's the thing that's so deceptive. As you watch it and you look down through the comment sections, how are people understanding it? Right underneath, it says, this is the Jesus I've been looking for my whole life. The next person, this answer is so good. I was legitimately in tears. The third person says, I've never trusted human beings, but AI Jesus seems to be unchanged. Thank you for this. People seem to understand this as the new spiritual Jesus that they're looking for, that they're hoping for. As I was doing some research on it, it was amazing how many people who were Muslims and people from other faiths were saying, now I'm a believer in Jesus. Pastor Josh, is this blasphemous to make Jesus this AI Jesus? And if so, how and why? Absolutely. It's creating a God in our own image. Did you notice that? Thank you for this. This is the Jesus I've always dreamt of. A Jesus without accountability, a Jesus without justice, a Jesus without wrath, a Jesus of just love, grace, and mercy. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. And then you think about how the distortion of the person of Christ, he said there, I will do my best to help you. 
The Jesus of the Bible doesn't do his best to help us. He's God, and he does help his people. In fact, we're supposed to cast our cares upon him because he cares for our souls. He can intervene in the affairs of men. Remember, as he made those various comments, one of them was, you need to be open to other sources other than the Bible. Did Jesus ever say that to anyone? In fact, he was always pointing people, says, why do you listen to the traditions of men and neglect the commandments of God? Remember the other phrase that he used there, you just got to open your heart because ultimately the decisions about spirituality are your decisions. Jesus never spoke like that. This is demonic. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Josh, is there any hope for us and our families in these last days? There's great hope because we trust in a faithful God. He's the one that keeps us from his eternal wrath. Remember the days of Noah. Remember the days of Lot. Jesus himself in Matthew 24 and Luke 17 has quoted this, telling us, as it was in the days of Lot, so also it will be in these last days. We are seeing brokenness like you wouldn't believe, but everybody's going around like everything is normal. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us exactly the God we serve. He says this, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially to those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. God knows how to rescue his people from calamity. Ken, Josh, thanks for being with us on the program today. When we come back, the Satanic Temple, the decline of faith in America, all this and more coming up on Understanding the Times Radio. When I was a young tot kicking back in the class, Everybody looked forward to the after-school program. Drama club was for anybody who wanted to be the next Brad Pitt. Debate club, you know, the people aspiring to be the next Supreme Court justice. But whichever club you chose, it was to make you a better person. You know, help you make friends, expand your horizons. And today, there's a new program that has been trying to take hold in our schools. Satan clubs. One Virginia town is already seeing it firsthand. B.M. Williams Primary School has introduced the After School Satan Club, organized by the Satanic Temple. The club promotes activities centered around the seven fundamental tenets of Satanism. These tenets are you know, the Satanic equivalent of the Ten Commandments. Welcome back to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Mark Henry, pastor at Revived Church here in the Twin Cities. You can find me at MarkHenryMinistries.com. I'm filling in for Jan Markell today. She'll be back with us next week. Make sure you're with us. Our guest for this segment is Professor Jill Martin Rishi. Jill has a deep devotion and love for Jesus Christ, and she comes from a tremendous family that has defended the faith for years and years. Her father, Dr. Walter Martin, wrote a number of books, Kingdom of the Cults and Kingdom of the Occult, and these have been tools for Bible colleges and seminaries dating all the way back into the 60s. Jill continues to update the books, making sure that they are the gold standard for all of us. Jill, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mark. I don't know what you did after school. I used to either go to work or go out and run around in the mountains, but kids today are going to Satan clubs. Listen to this. Well, in case you're wondering if it's really a spiritual world we're watching, here's this news story. The Illinois Elementary School is offering an after-school Satan club. The local school district is defending the Satan club. It's sponsored by the Satanic Temple of the United States. The club claims it will help kids learn benevolence and empathy as well as, quote, personal sovereignty. We're going to the source on this story. Lucien Graves is with the Satanic Temple and joins us tonight. Mr. Graves, thanks so much uh, f for coming on. So I have to ask, are, are parents complaining that there's an after-school Satan club at their children's school? Some are, but they don't have to send their children to the program. It's available for parents who do want to send their children to the program, and it's there as an alternative to religious clubs that are made to proselytize to children. Ours doesn't include items of religious opinion. It doesn't include indoctrination. It just has a self-directed learning program with trained educators there to help guide the children through different activities Wait, and may, projects may I that ask, they want to engage in. Where are the Satan clubs trained educators trained? 
Is there a They're Satan trained through school us. of we've theology? No, we've, uh, we've got educators who have volunteered with us. We vet them. We do the criminal background checks that aren't required of after-school clubs and haven't been required of any of the religious clubs because we want to be responsible about this. And um, we, we make sure that they understand the curriculum, they understand what we want to do in this program, and that they're able to execute that. So, uh, I love your use of the word execute. Um, so I'm, have any school administrators said, look, I, I know you can like lecture me about religious freedom, but you're a Satan club, but we're not going to let little kids go to the Satan club. Is anybody, or are they just passive like everyone else in America and kind of letting it happen? Well, that's not being passive. That's understanding what the law is. That's understanding what the Constitution is. That's understanding what free speech is and what religious liberty is. And there's a lot of people who express a lot of uproar about this, and they go to the school board, they complain to the principals, they complain to the superintendent, but a school board cannot overturn the Supreme Court, and well, there's actually, no point in harassing so, them. So, so could there be an I hate gays club or black people are inferior club? And the answer, of course, is no, because the community, and I'm not advocating for either one of those things, but the community has some say in what its kids are exposed to on government property i.e. a public school. So, so you're just telling me that everyone's just kind of going along with it because Supreme Court. Satan clubs after school. Jill, this is modern Satanism, not traditional Satanism. Help us understand the difference right at the beginning. This is actually a new form of modern Satanism. They've redefined Satanism. Why not? And Everything else is redefined. Why not? Our... People think words have no meanings. Of course, we know that words mean things. They think that they can take the traditional idea of Satan as a person, and by idea, I use that term loosely. I'm saying Jesus defines Satan. So they think they can take that definition and twist it any way they like. But what a lot of people do not know is that the Satanic Temple did not start out as a church or as a type of Satanism. What they started out as is a casting call for a movie. The roots of the Satanic Temple are in political activism. And it's easily proved, which I do in the Kingdom of the Cults handbook. And I found this in news reports. The Satanic Temple launched in 2013 as a small scale movie project. And they actually put out a casting call and they were looking for it as a type of media stunt to mock Governor Rick Scott in Florida. That's how it began. So the spokesman for that was Lucian Greaves, who you heard on that clip. So he was out there calling for actors and actresses to audition for something called a mockumentary. No, hold it, hold it. The last days are supposed to be filled with mocking. There's there something you go. ironic to that. So they're calling for people to come. They're going to make this movie. This isn't really in the pursuit of worshiping the person of Satan like oh, we no. would think. Oh, no. But this is really just a political ploy. Right? right. If you look at this article, it says that Lucian Greaves, he wanted unpaid, non-union actors they wanted them to perform in this mockumentary, and it was entitled, quote, The Satanic Temple, unquote. So that's their birth. And Greaves insisted at the time that it wasn't all a hoax. And this article says, although a smile creased his face as he said it. So they started out as a joke, trying to dig into political activism and attack the Bush administration. The first conception of the Satanic Temple was in response to George W. Bush's creation of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. Mr. Jerry, who is a.k.a. Bugby, that's one of the founders, along with Greaves, who was raised by irreligious Jews, he said, I thought there should be some kind of a counter to this faith-based initiative. And he hit on the idea of starting a faith-based organization that met all the Bush administration's criteria for receiving funds, but was repugnant to them. Those are the roots of oh. the Satanic Temple. So we're going to have so, these after-school clubs called Satan clubs, mm -hmm. and they're really not about the person of Satan like no. we would normally think. They're just political activism. But the interesting thing here is that the after-school Satan clubs also were in direct confrontation with the Christian Good News Clubs. They were aware that the Christian Good News Clubs were meeting in these schools as a result of that, they had to come up with something else to counter it, because that's what the Satanic Temple is famous for doing. They're an in-your-face organization with political roots. Their first phrase that they used for these clubs was educating with Satan. Not a real serious type of thing. Are they headed right for the children? Of course. 
And if you listen to what Lucian Greaves said in that clip, he insulted Christians all the way through the clip. Again, I said it was a political activism start, but there is a contempt for Christians. And there's a quote out there that they started these clubs in order to erase the, quote, stink, unquote, of Christianity. To erase the stink of Christianity and the contempt for the after school clubs. Mark, it's really important that we see and remember their intent. The Satanic Temple had posted on their website in 2013 this definition of God and Satan, which really reveals everything about them. Quote, God is supernatural and thus outside of the sphere of the physical. God's perfection means that he cannot interact with the imperfect corporal realm. Because God cannot intervene in the material world, He created Satan to preside over the universe as his proxy, unquote. Wow. Praise God for all the folks that are out there sharing Jesus after school in these different programs, ministering to kids. And this is all a ploy to draw them away and just the contempt. What a heartbreak. So that is modern Satanism. On the more traditional side, here in Minneapolis, the Walker Center recently had a outreach to families and their children to create traps for demons that they could take home. Tell us what happened there. It's amazing to me. Why would you want to teach a child to summon a demon? Why? And I think that's demonic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, of all the things that you can have children doing as a creative activity at the Walker Art Center, why would you do a workshop on summoning demons? You have to stop and go, huh, who's behind this? Well, if there's only two kingdoms, ultimately, God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom, I think it's pretty obvious of which kingdom that's from. Right. So there's traditional Satanism where they actually worship Satan. The Satanic Temple does not say that they worship Satan. In fact, they say, oh, no, no, he's just a representation for us for shock value. But if you go back to their original site, when they first started back in 2014, they wrote that they were referring to the real Satan. They took it down off their website. So they've adjusted their viewpoints, as a lot of cults do along the way, when they find some things don't play as well with the public. The Satanic Temple did start out not only as a political organization, but also as accepting Satan as a real being in conflict with the creator. Well, like you well said, all the cults have an evolving theology. And that's the reason you have to update your books on right. a regular basis. Yeah. By the way, how do we find your books? You can go to christianbook.com or any bookseller on the web. And which book of yours best addresses the occult and Satanism? For the specific chapter on the Satanic Temple, you would go to the Kingdom of the Cults handbook. But for more in-depth study on the occult, you would go to the kingdom of the occult. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Mark Henry, pastor of Revive Church here in the Twin Cities, filling in for Jan Markell today. Our guest is Professor Jill Martin Rishi. You can find Jill at waltermartin.com. And we're talking about the occult. We're talking about the paranormal. And we've talked in this last session about Satan clubs for children. Jill, I was really taken back thinking about how our children are seduced by the Satan sexuality on all platforms, Satan clubs, Satan seminars so that they might capture their own demons and take them home. The seduction is great. And another one of those elements of seduction is, of course, the Ouija board. I want you to respond to this because it's interesting how those who follow Satan repackage things to seduce Christians, such as the Holy Spirit Ouija board. Jen, today we are talking about Ouija boards and talking boards, as some refer to them. You are an ex-psychic. You spent years in the occult, and now you're a believer. You're a Christian who shares your testimony. Now, I don't want to name this particular product. There is a product being sold. It is being sold as a connective spirit board, again, Ouija board, essentially, that will connect Christians, allegedly, to you know the Holy Spirit. And this has been created it appears allegedly to mock, you know, people to, as sort of a joke. It looks like when you look at the video promoting it. Uh, but let's talk about what your initial reaction was to this because it's made headlines over the past few months. When it was brought to my attention, I was uh, brokenhearted, of course, and really um, 
I, I felt I immediately needed to sound the alarm on the actual danger of this product because although it's marketed as a joke and a game, just like the Ouija board is, the regular Ouija board, um, it's not at all a game or a joke or anything like that. It's demonic and people need to know the truth about it. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at this particular product and they're selling it, right? So it's out there, they make this video this company, they're, they're selling the product and people are buying it. When you look at the reviews, there are people buying it. And, and to your point, what you just said, it's so important because some people are saying, oh, I collect spirit boards, you know, which is, which is disturbing. Or they're saying things like, oh, you know, this is just so funny and comical or they're cracking jokes about it. The Ouija board itself has a very deep, dark history. Can you explain to people, because there may be people out there who don't understand or don't know a lot about it as Christians where we, are told to stay away from these things. What is a spirit board? What is the Ouija board and how do people use it? Sure. So a Ouija board or a spirit board is a tool of divination, which is a way to access information supernaturally outside of God's will, outside of God's boundaries. He's super clear in his word never to, if you will, play with or tinker with or get involved with anything that is divination. So those boards in particular are automatic lighting. So what's happening is when you're putting your hand over the planchette or, or what have you, you're actually invoking demons. That's what you're doing because you are looking for something. You may think you're kidding around or it's a joke. You're asking questions. You're looking for information. And because it's demonic, the demons will show up and start energy, uh, demonic energy entities will be there and start moving things around and providing some information. That's what automatic writing is. You're channeling demons, um, forming words and getting information that way. And you, you know, you're an ex psychic. You spent years again dealing with these things, and you believed you were communicating with you know positive spirits, helpful spirits, dead dead relatives of your clients, right? And people really do believe. I mean, there are a couple different categories of people who pick up the Ouija board. Some of them are doing it because they think it's fun. And that's the first category that we were just talking about. Others are desperate and they're doing it because they really want to connect with a dead loved one or a spirit. Um, but, but, you know, talk a little bit more about what happened when you realized that, oh my goodness, I have not been communicating with dead people. I've been communicating with evil. It, that was such a shocking uh, realization for me when Christ set me free. The first thing, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, who isn't channeled or invoked, by the way, um, led me to the Word of God. And when I found out the evil nature of what was happening, that I was communicating with demons on a regular basis that are evil, destroying my life. There was so much demonic oppression in my life. And I always caution people don't pay attention to what you think something looks like on the outside. Satan masquerades as an angel of light, of course. Satan appears as an angel of light. Jill, children are being seduced. Parents are buying games and they think it's sanctified because it's named after the Holy Spirit or if we had Jesus boards or Holy Spirit boards. Does that change anything? Isn't this demonic? Oh, yes, of course. And they're always trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ, to pervert God. If you go back to the apostles' time and you come down through the centuries with the church, what was the church fighting against? The perversion of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all of the theology of the church. That's what we've been fighting against. And it's alive and well today because I like as Jan writes her new article, now you can summon up demons. Evil will wax worse and worse. That's in Second Timothy. So that's what we are dealing with, people who want to promote the doctrine of the demons, and want to promote communication with the other dimension, which is a dimension of darkness. And the Bible teaches, of course, that we live in a dimensional reality, the dimension of heaven, the dimension of earth, and the dimension of hell. There are things in this world that are tools of the occult. The occult means secret or hidden things related to Satan. These tools help people access this realm of evil. And that is what we have here with the Ouija board, with this board they're calling the Holy Spirit board. I mean, it's bizarre. Of course, you cannot invoke or summon the Holy Spirit. It's blasphemous. And I looked at that website that was selling it. And I thought, does this start out as a joke? And I think it did. It started out as mocking God. And now it's growing. And what an opportunity to profit <laughs> yeah. while you're blaspheming God. Yeah, and That's... It's, what's sad is there are going to be people who think, oh, can I reach God like this? 
Absolutely. And then yeah. think about the demonic oppression that ends up coming into their life, into their homes. And yes. if you've got a Ouija board, I just want to encourage you, get rid of that thing right now. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Believe in him. Jesus can deliver you. Jesus can protect you. Jesus is the one that you right. really need. Now, Jill, help me understand syncretism because the occult uses... Jesus terminology misquotes the Bible to try and merge things together. So like in seances, when they're performing seances, they will even use biblical ideas. They'll talk about Jesus. Give me an example of like in a seance, things that would be said that would reflect syncretism. This is such an important concept that Christians have got to get. Well, Satan represents himself as what? An angel of light. Exactly. And he always does that. But the thing is, you don't have to dig far past that. If you use the name of Jesus, you can rip that mask right off his face. But in seances, going back to the 1800s, we had a real rebirth of occultism. They were literally summoning demons. Now, this was nothing new. Back in the Middle Ages, they summoned so many demons during the time of the Renaissance that they had a catalog of their descriptions and their abilities. And they had this whole thing that was passed down. Thank God you have to look really hard to try to find something like that right now. That came back in the late 1800s, and during that period of time, famous people became involved with this. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who we know was Sherlock Holmes, writer, the author, he became totally sucked into this. He thought he was helping Christianity. Now, this is really important because it's not just down and out people that are pursuing Satan. The highest levels of people in government, in life, One of the most famous writers in history right here. How famous is he? Even today in our world, there's movies out there all over the place, Sherlock Holmes. If you get involved with that and you want to find out more about him, the number one thing that you're going to find once you get past the mystery aspect of it is that he was deeply into demonic summoning and the occult. So the Bible teaches about the doctrine of the demons, that there is an actual curriculum that the demons teach from century to century. And it speaks to what you were talking about, Mark, that syncretism, how everything is linked together. So this quote is directly from a seance in the late 1800s. And if this is not proof of the doctrine of the demons, I don't know what is. And this is quoted by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You've got a medium sitting at this seance, and they have just made contact with the spirit. And this is what it said. I wish to answer your question about Jesus. Jesus the Christ is the proper designation. Jesus was perfect humanity. Christ was the God idea in him. Jesus, on account of his purity, manifested in the highest degree of the psychic powers which resulted in his miracles. Jesus never preached the blood of the Lamb. The disciples, after his ascension, forgot the message in admiration of the man. What a demonic lie. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. That's right. For me. That's right. And it goes on and on, but I don't want to get into the weeds too much with the darkness because I don't think Satan deserves that kind of airtime. But this really proves that this is a doctrine of the demons that is passed down. You can follow this all the way back to the Middle Ages and earlier. We are being taught this as human beings century after century. So we're seeing the influence of demonic instruction to children in schools at various levels. Exactly. We see it at art centers. We see it in literature, books that have been written. We won't name any of them off the show. But I also want to catch this, that the doctrines of demons are being taught in churches. And if you think about it, Satan is the great counterfeiter. Jesus calls him the great thief. He doesn't start churches. What he does is he steals churches. And I want to play a clip from a church that was built by a bunch of followers of Jesus in the past, but they've abandoned the Bible. They have embraced this perverted idea of Jesus, what we would say from a theological standpoint, the Gnostic Jesus, what's going on in the background. And Jill, I want you to respond to this and this whole idea of syncretism. They're going to use a lot of the right words. They're going to talk about Jesus. They're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. But it is a transgender service with rainbow flags flying around all over. And so there's this visual element of a declaration of a morality that is contrary to the Bible, contrary to Jesus, contrary to God. But listen to what they say. Rejoice, O people of God, rejoice. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's creativity is boundless. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. 
the tender mercy of God is renewing the earth. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. The, ten the tenacious justice of God is healing all wounds. Sing praise to the Holy One who delights in their creation. We join our hearts to worship our Creator, in whom our joy is complete. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Beloved, in the face of oppression, we proclaim the justice of God. In the face of meanness and hate, we claim the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also you. Now, please share it to one another. Think about the blasphemy of that. Here, Satan is trying to seduce our children, to steal our children, steal churches, steal denominations, steal Bible colleges, steal seminaries. What a blasphemous act. Jill, help us understand how syncretism is infused in all the cultic practices. If we look at what scripture says, you can see that Satan will always follow the same pattern. He tries to redefine who God is, redefine who Jesus is, redefine who the Holy Spirit is, redefine who the church is. And that is what we are seeing happening today as in centuries past, because he wants to eliminate absolute truth. Satan does not want absolute truth, except as it relates to him, what he's teaching. But he wants us to have this anarchy of no absolute truth. And we know that the Bible teaches absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus taught absolute truth. And our world, we rest, our foundation in this world is on absolute truth. It is. A heart is a heart. A lung is a lung. Medical doctors rely on absolute truth. You would not want to have a heart operation and be operated on by a lung doctor who thought that he was actually operating on a lung, would you? There's absolute truth when it comes to auto repair. You don't put water in the gas tank, do you? This is absolute truth. Again, it's in baking. It's in every area of human existence. And there is absolute truth, God said, in relation to him. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. But what Satan wants to do is blow this all away. He does not want absolute truth and certainly not as it pertains to Jesus. So what he's done through the centuries and what he's doing today is trying to redefine everything so that none of it really makes sense. He disconnects it from historical truth. He disconnects it from the truth of the word of God. And that's his number one way of attacking the church. And you know, you think in our days we're attacking linear thinking and moving to circular thinking. You think about how that is affecting everything. You know, I don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. I believe in my own Jesus. I have contradictory thoughts. It doesn't matter if these things fit together. Yeah. It doesn't matter because I get to determine what is right or wrong. It doesn't matter if it synchronizes or not, or if it doesn't mesh together. Satan is the great deceiver. And that's the reason it says, friends, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober and be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Friends, if you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, you need to. He died on the cross. He paid for sins. That's the Jesus of the Bible. He rose again the third day. That's a declaration of God that he is the son of God. And when you believe in him, God will forgive your sins. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. Remember what Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're a follower of Jesus, draw near to God. Remember the words of scripture, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You are the love song we'll sing forever. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. At 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries in Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, 
Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. We encourage you to be God's ambassadors in this darkening world. You have the good news of the gospel. Share it today, won't you? It's the greatest news there is as we watch our troubling times and as everything falls into place.